Number seven is super important, right? The total assessment of belief cannot unfold in what Stroud says, a piecemeal way, right? You can't, and I'll talk about this in a second, and I'll actually read a bit, right? You can't, this, this process of categorization and assessment and, and analysis, it can't be the piecemeal. I'll, I'll take a little bit from here, the contents of my knowledge of, over here. I have this one belief about my relationship with my family. Uh, I have this other belief about my relationship with my students. And I finally have a you know, sort of piecemeal. I have a relationship, uh, my belief of my relationship with you as a virtual student, right? Um, it, it cannot unfold in a piecemeal way. I'll be more exact in the meaning of that in a second. That is holistic epistemological scrutiny. Holistic epistemological scrutiny cannot unfold by assessing individual components of that collective knowledge, right? It cannot unfold, and I'm going to read more um, from page eight. It cannot unfold about the individual beliefs of collective knowledge, right? It's not about my particular belief of X. X, whatever X might be, is one instantiation, one representative from a larger categorization. And the idea is, at this very general level, is to rather approach the process of scrutinizing the contents of my knowledge by itemizing and individualizing instances of beliefs, it's a better thing to categorize these beliefs into larger sets. So that's the idea in a, in a sort of general sense. So let me look at, let me look at um, one bit and I'll explain it. It's sort of the, the top of page, page eight, first column. Not immediate top. Um, Stroud says, for one thing, it probably makes no sense, strictly speaking, to talk of the number of things one believes. If I am asked whether it is my belief that I went to see a film last night, like obviously the film example that I gave earlier came from the book, but um, went to see a film last night, I can truly answer yes. If I asked whether it was one of my beliefs that I went to see the movie last night, I would give the same answer. Have I thereby identified two or one of my beliefs? The idea is, if the perceiver, just is super general, right? Perceiver is here. There's another person that's questioning the perceiver about the contents of the perceiver's belief. And the perceiver wants to see a movie. And I ask, I ask the perceiver, do you believe that you went to see the movie? That answer is going to occupy some space. That answer is the belief that the perceiver has that he went to see a movie. Now, if I, just to be a philosopher, and it's not my example, this is Stroud's example, this is what he's saying, if I ask the perceiver about his belief that he went to see a movie, this is a meta level, if I ask the perceiver about his belief not his seeing the movie, but his belief that he wants to see the movie, do I occupy, that's the question, do I occupy an additional space in the content of my knowledge, right? Is, and this is a very important point. I, I will not be able to address the answer to this in this series um, just yet. We'll have to get a lot more information because this becomes highly, highly debated. The epistemological community is to this day still divided on some of these questions. But the idea is simple, right? My belief that I saw a movie last night is, the question is, is that different? Does it occupy a different quote unquote position within the totality of my epistemological sort of data set than my belief that I believe I saw a movie, right? And thus infinitely, right? There, there it seems to be a way of, of unfortunately, I don't want to use the word monopolizing, you know, um, wrong, wrongly, but I think it's the appropriate word here. It's a way of monopolizing, monopolizing, one belief monopolizing the sum total, right? You can fall into this infinite regress. So some will say that no, beliefs and meta-beliefs are conflated into a uniform single belief, which occupies one, if you will. They're, they're, the terminology is, is gross at this level. It's more of a conceptual game to get your brain warm. But 
the, the sum total of the potential infinite regress of meta-beliefs is consolidated into one belief rather than the potential infinity of beliefs, right? So I'm just going to read it without elaborating now just so that it's clear. For one thing, it probably makes no sense, strictly speaking, to talk of the number of things one believes. If I am asked whether it is one of my beliefs that I went to see the film last night, I can truly answer yes. If I were asked whether it is one of my beliefs that I went to see the movie last night, I would give the same answer. Have I thereby, very important, have I thereby identified two or only one of my beliefs, which is what I'm talking about now. How is that question ever to be settled? If we say that I identified only one of my beliefs, it would seem that I must also be said to hold the further belief that going to see the film and going to see the movie, he's doing a play on film and movie here, um, are one and the same thing. So we would have more than one belief after all, right? And thus the rub, right? We're not giving answers right now, we're just complicating the problem, which is precisely the point. So if you, you shouldn't be confused, but if you recognize that there's a, there's, well, both positions could potentially be true, then you're precisely where you need to be. So we would have more than one belief after all. The prospects of arriving even at a principle of counting beliefs, let alone an actual number of them, seems dim. Right? The idea then, now, because of this problem, we recognize that, well, maybe we're approaching the categorization and the organization of our epistemological data set, content of knowledge, is wrong. If, by this organizational process, we approach the process by attempting to organize based on beliefs. Why? Because, as Stroud says, this seems to be a very piecemeal way of doing it. Right? And the idea is much more complicated concepts, which I can't introduce right now. It, there's, just, there's just an overwhelming, there's an overwhelming um, amount of content knowledge that we have and there's really no way that we could organize it, right? So, um, the image that I drew, which I'm not going to write on the board per se because it's pretty simple, um, leaving the house with wet hair and the idea that doing so causes a cold, right? Number eight, uh, Straub says, it probably makes no sense, strictly speaking, to talk of the number of things that one believes. The idea is simple, and, and it's this. If I have the belief, which is now antiquated and has been proven false, we all recognize that you get the flu from viral infection, but there used to be a time at which, and even in my life, you know, if you go outside in the cold um, and it's raining, you can get a cold. If you wash your hair and you don't dry it immediately, you can get a cold, like the flu. If you know, if you, what are some of the other, if you walk in the, <laughs> we used to hear this in Jamaica, I don't know if this is, a, if Americans and others hear this, but in Jamaica, if you walk around in cold tile without shoes on, you can get a cold. And there was some correlational validation for this, right? People who were known to walk on tile without their shoes found themselves getting sick. Um, and they would reference the fact, oh yeah, I, I walked around with, without shoes on. The fact that the fact that my nose is running and I didn't dry my hair after I came out. I don't have much hair to dry, but uh, I didn't dry my, dry my hair after I came out of the shower as, uh, as a means to demonstrate that this is the cause of my having a cold. The idea is, importantly, and this is the point of the example, is that, that all of those sets of beliefs of the relationship between my actions in the world, not wearing shoes, not drying my hair, going outside in the rain, and all of their consolidated attribution to gaining the flu virus have been all discredited. They've all been discredited by science. Epistemology isn't in a position to counteract the facts of science, right? That's not what, it, it, there's, a, there's a, in a sense, a symbiotic relationship. There's an adaptability, right? And as we said before, we have to make sure that the contents of our knowledge are, are flexible. At one time, I used to believe that if I washed my hair and didn't dry it, that I would get a cold. I recognize that that's no longer a valid reason for justifying or legitimizing my gaining the cold virus, thus every belief of that type collapses. What then happens to the content of my knowledge? How does that transform the
the content of my knowledge. Again, I'm not giving you answers yet, right? It's not about answers. It's about you 